pleased and very proud to present to the convention this morning Monsignor George G. Higgins. Monsignor Higgins pursued his graduate study in economics and political science at the Catholic University of America. He received his MA degree in 1942, his PhD in 1944, and attended the Institute for Continuing Education in Rome, Italy in 1973. Monsignor Higgins was ordained a priest of the Catholic Archdiocese of Chicago at St. Mary in 1940 and was elevated to the very Reverend Monsignor in 1953. He has taught in the Department of Economics School of Social Science at Catholic University. Presently, Monsignor Higgins is the Secretary for Special Concerns of the U.S. Catholic Conference. Prior to this appointment, he served as Secretary for Research of the Conference, member of the staff, Assistant Director and Director of the Social Action Department of the National Catholic Welfare Conference. Monsignor Higgins authors a weekly syndicated column, The Yardstick, as well as an occasional reviewing of books and writing articles for Commonwealth and America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor for a Protestant labor leader to introduce to our convention this morning one of the great outstanding Catholic leaders of our nation, Monsignor George G. Higgins. <laughs> Thank you, Vic, Archbishop Hannon, my old friend, Father Vincent O'Connell, who's with us on the platform, delegates and friends. When I received the printed program for this convention a few days ago, or a week or so ago, and glanced at it hurriedly, I felt a bit sorry for myself on discovering that I would be speaking immediately before Tom Dunahoo who is the administrative assistant to George Meany, the president of the AFL-CIO, uh, who could tell you more in 10 minutes than I could tell you in a week about the problems confronting the American labor movement. But when I discovered that both Tom Donahue and I were scheduled to speak immediately before Valerie Harper, I felt sorry not only for myself, but for Tom as well. <laughs> I had the pleasure of meeting Valerie Harper, last night, we came in from the airport in the same car, I stopped, and this seems to be a Louisiana custom that took me by surprise. We stopped and uh, visited the governor's mansion on the way in. Uh, where he was, I don't know. I think he was upstairs wondering what uh, these prowlers were doing down below. <laughs> but I clearly got the impression that uh, the appearance, my appearance, and the appearance of Tom Gunner, who immediately before Valerie, will be something like the Pro-Am golf tournament that I caught a glimpse of on television last Sunday. It was a ladies' tournament played in one of the courses near San Diego. The ladies burned up the course, and their partners were all men, and they were at best weekend golfers. And I think we're going to see a repetition of that this morning. Anyhow, on with the program. I can think of only one reason for my being here, and that is that after 25 years or more in the history of your conventions, you're tired of hearing Vincent O'Connell's speech, so they decided to bring in an outsider. I've learned the hard way during the past 35 years or so in traveling around the country to conventions of this type not to talk about local issues for obvious reasons. And therefore, I will not talk about the Baton Rouge teacher strike, which I read about for the first time in this morning's papers or about the recently concluded police strike in New Orleans. There are several reasons for not talking about that. One of them is that the Archbishop is sitting immediately to my left. <laughs> However, I do not feel under the same constraint with regard to another issue which may be thought of as being local, but is really national in scope. And that is the pending controversy, which I'm sure will be a very heated one in the state of Louisiana over right to work legislation. That's a national issue. It is not merely a Louisiana issue, and therefore I feel perfectly free to discuss it from my point of view. 
I had intended to talk about more current issues, more immediate issues, issues which are closer to my experience, my present current experience, but I discovered in talking to Tom Donahue this morning that he's going to cover most of those matters, so I will say for the record, and only for the record, some things about the right to work controversy. I do so uh, with some diffidence, almost regretfully, because one would have hoped that this issue would be behind us by this time. There's nothing new that anyone, including myself, can say about it. And therefore, I apologize in advance for repeating what all of you know, but I think since the issue is coming to the fore, since it will be a hotly debated issue uh, in this state and around the nation uh, in the next um, few months, um, it might be well to put something on the record concerning the issue, no matter how out of date it may seem to be. Missouri, as you know, recently went through a referendum battle over right-to-work legislation, and I'm pleased to say, and there are people here who could confirm this from their own experience, I met a few St. Louis people here this morning, uh, who could confirm the fact that the Missouri Catholic Conference, representing all of the dioceses of the state of Missouri, uh, took a strong role of leadership in that battle and I think contributed substantially to the defeat of the referendum. In opposing the right to work amendment in that state, the Missouri Conference cut through the thicket of anti-union propaganda being put forth by proponents of the amendment and went right to the heart of the matter. The conference said that the amendment would so impede the effectiveness of collective bargaining that the right itself would be seriously imperiled, a right which the state been emphasized has long been vigorously supported by the Roman Catholic Church. The American experience, it said, has shown that the union shop has consistently been an aid to ensure the benefits of collective bargaining. The position of the Missouri Catholic Conference on this matter is exactly the same as the position taken in your state many years ago by Archbishop Rummel, by Father O'Connell, by the late Father Toomey, and by many others, not only from my own religious community, but from other religious communities as well. It's exactly the position taken by the U.S. Catholic Conference from the very beginning of the controversy over right to work, exactly the position taken when we last testified before the U.S. Congress on this matter some 13 years ago. The best that I can hope to do this morning, and again with apologies for repeating matters which are old hat to many of you, is to summarize what we said at that time. But first of all, it will be helpful, even though it may sound like ABCs, to go back and define the terms of the right to work controversy, because it has been my experience, and I'm sure it will be yours in this state before very long, that there is a great deal of confusion, much of it deliberately inspired over the very term itself. A right to work law may be defined as an act which forbids an employer to require membership in a union as a condition for retaining employment. The history of, this, of such legislation is very pertinent to the debate which is about to erupt here in your own state. Prior to 1935, with the enactment of the Wagner Act, the right of workers to organize into unions of their own choice was often denied, bitterly denied, and fought by American employers. The National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act, passed in 35 and declared constitutional in 1937, was the first fully effective legal guarantee of this natural right. Under this act, the federal government protected workers who wished to join unions, provided that they were employed in industries subject to federal jurisdiction. Under our Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, the federal act superseded all state laws where interstate commerce was affected. However, when this act was replaced or amended in 47, by the Labor Management Relations Act, the so-called Taft-Hartley Act, a very unusual and exceptional constitutional device was used. In matters of union security, but only in matters of union security, the Congress gave the states concurrent jurisdiction, provided only that the state laws were more restrictive than the federal law, a most unusual constitutional procedure. Under the impetus of this provision, a number of states, I don't know exactly what the number is now, 17 or 18, have enacted right-to-work laws. And currently, in your own state, and as we learned in Missouri, 
And as we will probably learn in other states as well during the next year, the question of enactment or repeal of such laws is being considered by many state legislatures. And worse than that, referenda are being considered to make it a matter of con the constitution of the state. The general effect of such laws is to prohibit all types of so-called compulsory union membership, union security. The closed shop, which many people continue deliberately at times to confuse with the union shop, was already outlawed by the 1947 Federal Act, the Taft-Hartley Act. But the state laws go further and forbid the union shop. They forbid maintenance of membership and all other forms of modified union security. And while such laws may not constitutionally deny labor's right to organize into freely chosen unions, they do outlaw a traditional form of union management relationship sanctioned by long usage in our country. In order to evaluate fairly the ethical or the moral implications of these laws, it is necessary to present and weigh the major arguments proposed in debates on the question. And I would say that if you can get these issues truly debated in Louisiana, you'll have a good chance of defeating the referendum. But you'll have to work hard to do it because there is a massive campaign being geared up right now, I'm sure, to confuse the issue. Let me treat these arguments, first of all, the arguments which are primarily economic or social or political, and then say a few words which those, about those which, uh, in which ethical considerations are paramount. As a first point, it should be noted that the common title of these laws is in itself a matter of serious debate, to put it as mildly as possible. Opponents of these measures, and I would include myself among them, claim that the title is a semantic device used to cloak the real purpose of the laws, which is to enforce further restrictions upon union activity. Such laws do not provide jobs for workers. They merely prevent workers from attaining security for unions of their choice. In 1954, the Supreme Court of Idaho took judicial notice or cognizance of this fact by refusing to permit such a deceptive title on an initiative measure to be proposed to the voters. It should also be noted that the pressure for such legislation does not arise from workers seeking their rights, rights in quotes. Proponents of these measures are uniformly employers, organizations, and related groups. Often such laws are part of a program by underdeveloped states seeking to attract industry by the lure of a docile and low-paid labor force. Campaigns of this nature have been carried on in recent years with little or no attempt at concealment. I'll have something to say about that in a moment, about the quite open admission on the part of some of the proponents of the Missouri referendum that their purpose was to weaken unions and to attract industry into the state on the basis of low wages and non-unionization. A second argument relating to the issue concerns states' rights. It is alleged that the several states should have the right to regulate labor problems according to their own desires, and that federal standards should not be imposed upon them. Superficially, a rather attractive argument if you don't look beneath the surface. This argument in relation to the present issue is far less than being honest. Under present conditions, the right to regulate labor problems has not been returned to the states. What is conceded is the limited power to enact union security regulations more stringent, more repressive than those in the federal law. But a state may not constitutionally enact regulations more favorable to the union movement. Independently of the semantic point just raised, there are very strong substantive reasons why states should not regulate labor matters where interstate commerce is involved. The greatness of our economy is attributable in no small measure to the absence of trade barriers and the presence of uniform conditions of commerce among the several states of the Union. Measures which would destroy this uniformity and erect barriers would be contrary to the general welfare. And therefore, we, most of the people who have spoken to this issue, I think, in the Catholic tradition, support the principle often called the principle of subsidiarity which holds that the powers of smaller groups should not be absorbed by larger and more powerful bodies. That is to say, genuine state powers should not be encroached upon unless the state in question has neglected its clear duty and thereby endangered the welfare of the Union. But under our Constitution, matters which affect interstate commerce 
are exclusively reserved to the federal government. Any trend in the contrary direction, even though constitutionally authorized by Congress, must be scrutinized with the greatest care. A third argument is partly political, partly ethical. It asserts that compulsory, so-called compulsory union membership, is contrary to the American tradition of freedom. The political slogan involved is superficially attractive, but it is in reality specious and corrosive. American freedom has never been absolute and anarchic. On the contrary, the genius of our Constitution lies in its unique combination of divided authority and balance of powers. No individual and no agency of government, at whatever level, has unlimited freedom. We rejected in this country the Articles of Confederation as being unworkable, precisely because they did not impose the discipline of ordered freedom upon the several states. The excessive freedom of the Articles was tearing apart the Union. And once again, in the tragic war between the states, our nation had to act to preserve unity against the claim of those who pushed freedom beyond the bounds of our Constitution. If there are strong objections to that phrasing, I'll be glad to strike it from the record, because I realize that I'm a little south of Chicago, Illinois at the present time. We also note the elements of semantic deception in this argument. Its proponents are claiming for workers a freedom which the latter do not desire. I would say parenthetically, you can always be extremely suspicious of someone who is trying to impose restrictions on workers when he himself is not a worker and says he's doing it in their name. Under the Labor Management Relations Act, a union might ask for a union shop or other form of union security only after a majority of the, the affected workers have approved such a request in a federally conducted secret ballot. This was under the original act. In nearly 50,000 such ballots, the percentage of workers favoring union security exceeded well over, exceeded 90% and well over 90%. So uniform was the response, in fact, that the requirement for a vote was dropped from the law in 1951. And those who have been following this matter over the years may recall that it was Senator Taft himself, the sponsor, one of the sponsors of the original Taft-Hartley Act, who openly declared on the floor of the Senate, let's get rid of this provision, it's meaningless. Obviously, the vast, overwhelming majority of workers who have been asked to vote on this matter have voted for union security. Therefore, why impose such a nonsensical, terribly expensive provision on the workers of this country? As a final argument, we might cite the claim that abuses of unionism, such as autocracy, misuse of funds, racketeering of one kind or another, thrive more readily under the union shop or maintenance of membership. Undoubtedly, this claim has some small basis in fact. But the remedy for abuses within a union or in any other organization in our country is not a measure which weakens a union in its legitimate functions. Present federal and state laws contain ample weapons which can be used to fight such abuses. Our major federation of, of labor unions, the AFL-CIO, is reacting strongly against evils of this nature. And when a useful and proper form of activity is occasionally abused, the remedy is to attack the abuse directly and not abolish the activity itself. As against occasional abuses of union security, it should be noted that in that the vast majority of cases it contributes to peaceful and harmonious labor relations. Such were the findings many years ago of the National Planning Association study on the causes of industrial peace, and such have been the findings of many similar studies since that time. When all the workers in a plant contribute to the union, there are no resentments against those who claim the benefits of unionism but do not pay the cost of providing these benefits. Our conclusion then is that on political, social, and economic grounds, the case for right to work laws is not sound, and that's putting it very mildly. To the contrary, the employer groups who espouse them are acting short-sightedly, even in terms of their own most selfish interests. The ethical issue involved in this controversy concerns the right to, quotes, compel union membership as a condition of employment. Even if, as is generally conceded, an overwhelming majority of workers wish a union shop in a given plant. Do they have the right to demand that the minority conform to this decision? Since the right to work is the right to life itself in many cases, may conditions be imposed upon this right? 
The response to both these questions in the tradition from which I come is a categorical yes. As the Archbishop said briefly in his opening prayer this morning, man is more than an individual. He is also a member of society. Such is his nature as God made him. And for this reason, the rules necessary for harmonious social living can be binding laws, not merely optional regulations. Thus, as members of civil society, we must obey laws, pay taxes, and fulfill our duties as citizens. As members of the family society, we have rights and duties, whether we be parents or children. Likewise, the common good of industrial society may demand that individuals conform to rules laid down for the good of all. I would go further and say that there is a strong trend of thought in our tradition which says that other things being equal, the average worker should consider it his duty to belong to a union for the good of all his fellow workers and the good of society as a whole. <laughs> Medical societies and bar associations generally have rights to lay down binding rules for their professions. Sometimes one wishes they would make these rules a little tighter. Teachers accept many obligations as conditions of employment. In the broader areas of industry, few, if any, workers enjoy an unconditional right to a job. I was talking to some workers this very morning. Their place of employment is neither here nor there, and I can assure you from the description of their work, they have anything but a right to a job. They're called in when there's work. They're let go as soon as the work stops, even if it's the middle of the day. They may get one day's work a week. They may get five. They may get none. They do not have a right to a job in this economy of ours today. The employer imposes rules concerning safety, performance of work, health and hygiene, and miscellaneous matters such as smoking and appearance. Often employees are required to buy and use company products, although thank God there's less of that today than there used to be. They may be obligated by pension or health plans as conditions of employment, if they're lucky. The principle behind such conditions is that the common good of the professional or plant community must prevail. In such areas, the right to impose conditions of employment is rarely questioned, even though the, the wisdom of an individual regulation might be debatable. If an employer and a union agree in collective bargaining that union security would aid industrial relationships, they are in effect laying down a regulation for the common good of their industrial community. When a worker accepts employment in that plant, he is no longer a detached, isolated individual. He is a member of the community and is governed by its rules. The alternative to such a procedure would be anarchy and the breakdown of industrial society. Considerations of this nature have prompted moralists of all religious persuasions to sanction the closed shop, the union shop, as a legitimate feature of union organization. Closed shop, of course, has been outlawed long since. Such has been the tradition of Catholic writers in this country for many, many years. Such undoubtedly were the considerations which prompted church authorities, all the dioceses of the state of Missouri, for example, in that recent controversy to oppose the referendum in that state. This tradition works to the best interest of labor, employers, and the general public. A secure, responsible labor movement is most likely to promote industrial peace and justice in our, in our nation. On this basis, we, I'm speaking using we in the broad sense, people like Father O'Connell, many, many others who have worked in this field for many years, not only oppose right to work legislation, but we go further and favor uniform standards on union security throughout the nation. Realistic and sound federal law should prevail in all such matters. Several weeks ago, in the presence of Tom Donahue, who will be speaking here shortly, I recently I took part in a public debate on this subject with a prominent spokesman for the National Right to Work Committee, the committee that's doing putting out the propaganda for these various state moves. The debate, which was held at Georgetown University, was not exactly a model of rational discourse. But no blood was shed, and my worthy opponent and I, despite our very bluntly stated differences, treated one another with what I think we, he would agree and I would agree, we, we treated one another with proper deference and respect and parted, I should like to think, as friends. We spent much of our time arguing back and forth about the real purpose of the Right to Work movement in general and the National Right to Work Committee in particular. 
My opponent argued that the sole purpose of the National Committee in opposing the union shop or other forms of union security is to protect the freedom of individual workers to join or not to join a union. The committee, he insisted, is not an anti-union organization. I argued contrarywise that the real purpose of the committee is to slow down the growth of trade unionism and collective bargaining. By way of example, I pointed out that one of the leaders in the committee's ill-fated campaign to enact a right-to-work initiative in Missouri had stated for the record, just before the election, and I'm quoting, once this right-to-work law is passed, it will be seen as a turning point in the decline of organized labor in the United States, meaning that if they won in Missouri, they had every intention of moving into other states, even industrialized states such as my own, the state of Illinois, and others to try to finish off the job. Already, he added, opponents of the union shop in four other states, all less industrialized than Missouri, had requested that the Missouri Committee expand the battle into those states. This was a frank admission that the Missouri Freedom to Work Committee was openly and professedly anti-union. According to the Wall Street Journal, a very good newspaper, but not exactly a labor-oriented paper, the Missouri Committee is made up, or was made up, of conservative activists bankrolled largely by Missouri business interest. There are many who think that the National Right to Work Committee is also being financed largely by anti-union business interest, and I'm one of them. My opponent in the Georgetown debate flatly denied this charge, but he made it perfectly clear that the committee will never, under any circumstances, reveal the source of its income. When I asked him if the committee, without revealing the names of its individual or corporate benefactors, would at least be willing to certify the percentage of money received from different categories, that is, corporations, housewives, doctors, lawyers, workers, etc., he declined to answer, thus confirming my own strong suspicion and that of many of those attending the Georgetown debate that the committee, like its smaller Missouri counterpart, is in fact being bankrolled largely by interests which are determined to weaken the trade union movement in this country. The only way that the committee can possibly dispel this lingering suspicion is to publish a certified financial report. I gather, however, that this will never happen. So it goes. I also have the impression from listening to my opponent in the Georgetown debate and from reading the committee's handouts and advertisements over a long period of years that despite its vigorous protestations to the contrary, the committee is concerned not with the right of workers to join or not join a union, but only with the latter. In debating this point, I asked, for example, why the committee, if it's so interested in labor's right to join or not to join, has never said a word, not a syllable, in defense of farm workers, chain workers in your own state, farm workers on the West Coast. It has never said a word about other workers in other industries, the southern textile workers, for example, whose right to organize has been flagrantly violated over a long period of years. Needless to say, I received no answer. In the same connection, I asked why the committee and or its local counterpart in California, and it has one there, had not supported Governor Brown's Agricultural Labor Relations Act of a few years ago, which incidentally had the support not only of organized labor and a number of church groups, but also of a number of California's leading growers. In response to this question, my opponent railed against the California statute, saying in effect that its purpose is to compel workers to join a union whether they want to or not. That statement, of course, is demonstrably contrary to fact. The purpose of the California statute is to provide farm workers with an opportunity to vote in supervised elections for the union of their own choice or to vote no union if they so desire. And I'm pleased to say that the first chairman of that board, Bishop Roger Mahoney, a member of the American hierarchy, a bishop at the time of his appointment, was the first chairman of that board and got it off to a very good start. I also asked my opponent why the committee doesn't spend at least a portion of its funds, whatever their source, on advertisements reminding the American people that it is the official policy of the United States government as stated in the preamble of the National Labor Relations Act, not only to tolerate, but to encourage, and the 
where it encourages, in quotes, to encourage collective bargaining. His answer, as I recall it, was very vague. The real answer, in my opinion, is that the committee doesn't really believe that collective bargaining should be encouraged, but contrarywise, like the Missouri gentleman quoted in the Wall Street Journal, is working for the decline of organized labor and the decline of collective bargaining. My opponent flatly denied this, but with all due respect to his sincerity and personal integrity, which I have no reason to doubt and do not doubt for a moment, I find it hard to reconcile his stated position on this matter with contrary statements by other prominent figures in the right to work movement and with the failure of the committee itself to reveal the source or sources of its income and to stand up for those workers who are clearly being denied the right to organize. In summary, everything I heard my opponent say during the Georgetown debate confirmed my opinion that the National Right to Work Committee and its state affiliates are anti-union organizations. Frankly, I would have more respect for these organizations if its leaders were to admit this vote very openly so that we could get on with the discussion, op admit it openly as the gentleman from Missouri did whom I quoted above. He stated without the slightest hesitation in the presence of a reputable reporter for a responsible newspaper that if the Missouri Act initiative was passed, that would mark the decline of organized labor in the United States, and that's telling the truth, and I admire him for doing it. I've taken up too much time, and I've gone over material which is familiar to all of you, but I thought it might be useful to get this on the record because you're heading for what is predictably going to be a long and, I suspect, a rather bitter struggle. I wish you well in it. But I would urge you, as you carry on the struggle for your own rights in this state, through the established union mechanism represented here in the State Fed Convention, not to be so concerned about your own rights that you forget about those whom we normally don't hear about. I'm not familiar in detail with the work that Father O'Connell and others are doing with the cane workers, but they need your help. They need all the help that this state fed can possibly give them. And I would hope, therefore, that you would not be exclusively concerned about matters which directly affect your own affiliates, but would reach, reach out and take the leadership, as I'm sure you're doing in many ways, to help those who are struggling to get even the basic minimum, which is the right to organize for purposes of collective bargaining. I would hope, too, that you would, to the extent that you can, look beyond the borders of your own state and think of the farm workers in California, now in Texas. They recently had a promising convention in the Valley of Texas, which I attended two or three weeks ago. They have workers in Florida and up and down the East Coast. They badly need the combined support of the entire labor movement, not only of their own members, and a handful of clergy and other religious leaders who may help them on the sidelines. I think history will judge the American labor movement uh, 50 years from now, mainly on what it did to help the least advantaged workers in our society enjoy the benefits which, however limited, you people now enjoy. And I encourage you to keep on doing what I'm sure you're already doing to a large extent in that direction. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Senior Higgins, on behalf of our delegates and friends, I want to thank you for that very inspiring message and to tell you that it's the best speech that I've ever heard against the right to work for less law, and I've heard a great number of them in my life. We will reproduce your speech and distribute it not only to every union in this state, but to as much of the business interest and the, and the industrial interest as we possibly can, and particularly to the members of the legislature. We are very grateful to you for that speech and for the information that you brought to us here today. I know that you are well aware of the love for the Catholics and the church that we have in the labor movement of our state. Thousands of our members are also members of the Catholic faith. And because of that, we feel that we walk together in most of the problems that we have in Louisiana. That we join with the church in the problems that they have and they join with us in the problems that we have. And I think it has been beneficial to all of us to do it in that fashion. In speaking out on the moral issue, 
And this is an issue that turns the minds of a great number of people on the right to work for less law. The question that someone is mandated to join a labor union who may not want to lays aside quite often the moral issue of the union man and woman who must give of their means to take care of the benefits of those who refuse to pay their part of the cost. It isn't easy to be a member of organized labor. Quite often you sacrifice your livelihood. Quite often you sacrifice the loss of your wages during strikes. You certainly pay much more in union dues because it takes more money to take care of the non-union person since you are charged by federal law with guaranteeing his or her benefits. If those of us in labor could get what we pay for, what we fight for, what we suffer for, and in many cases what we die for, without having to give it to those who refuse to participate in any way, then I say to you honestly and sincerely, we don't want to compel anybody to join a labor union. But we do feel. We do feel that the so-called moral issue will disappear if we could at any time say to the workers of America, you will get the benefits if you'll help to achieve those benefits and help to pay for them. That's the way that it ought to be in society. Men and women over the years have given of their lives so that you and I might be free. Unless we give of ourselves to make sure that everyone else enjoys that freedom, then we are not paying our debt to society. And we are certainly not being good Americans. So we believe the same thing applies to our fellow workers. All of us ought to join together to make sure that we pay the price that's necessary to get the blessings that God has given us in this country and the things that each of us want in our economic life each day. You know, most of us seldom think about it, and Senior Higgins, but God was good to those of us who were permitted to be born white, a man in the United States of America. We enjoy freedoms and blessings that many others don't. Look at the foreign countries where they don't have the blessings of God that we have. Look at the fact that women are treated differently in the United States from men. Look at the fact that those skins on people who are colored are treat, cause them to be treated differently from those of us who are born white. And certainly it all ties together. Each of us has a price to pay for what God has given to us. And we are very grateful to Monsignor Higgins and the great leaders of the Catholic Church for what they are doing for our fellow Americans here in this state and in our nation. There's no way that we can describe the love that we feel for you. And we are very grateful to you for coming and being with us today. We have a copy of your speech that we want to give to you. But we also assure you again that we're going to reproduce your speech and make it available to everyone because it is truly the best I've ever heard against that law. Executive assistant to the great leader of the AFL-CIO in our nation, the Honorable Thomas R. Donahue. I have looked forward for a long time to welcoming to our convention the man that I'm about to present to you today. I could go into all of the many things that he's done that's written down on this piece of paper, but I want to make this introduction a little bit more personal. Quite often, you know, we have to go to Washington on problems that deeply concern the labor movement of our nation and of our state. Very frequently, it necessitates meetings with Tom Donahue. When we were working together on the Labor Law Reform Act, 
when we work together on many of the other problems that you and I are familiar with. Tom Donahue is the man who spearheads those movements for George Meany and the AFL-CIO. I've had the privilege of meeting with many, many competent labor leaders in my life, but I've never met with any that were more dedicated, more knowledgeable, more willing, more friendly than Tom Donahue. The contributions he's made to organize labor of our country will truly go down in history. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very, very happy to present to you this morning one of the real great labor leaders of our nation, Thomas Donahue. Thank you very much. And thank you, Vic, for a most generous introduction. I heard somebody say once, and I think it fits that introduction, that I wish my parents were alive to hear it. My father would have enjoyed it, and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> I am grateful to you, sir. And I am delighted to be here and to bring you the greetings of President Meany and Secretary Treasurer Kirkland. Bring those greetings to your officers and to all the delegates to this convention. Baton Rouge is a nice city, and I'm pleased to be here. It's a comfortable hotel, wonderful convention, and a great crowd. There's a story I like to tell about what is it that attracts crowds to meetings like this. The story is of the Irish priest who was out visiting in the parish. And he was visiting in the home of a young couple, and the wife was expecting a child. And uh, while he was there, she went into labor. And the husband got very excited, and the priest said, Now, Pat, he said, don't be upset. He said, I used to be the chaplain in the hospital, and I know, know how to help out here. If you'll just come over here, Pat, and hold the lamp, I'll be happy to assist your wife. So Pat came over, and he was holding the kerosene lamp there, and the priest assisted the mother, and in due course, the child was born. And he looked up at Pat, and he said, Oh, Pat, you have a fine son. And Pat said, Oh, that's grandfather, but I do need a drink. And he went over, and he put the lamp down, and he just poured himself a little drop of the creature, just got the drink down. The priest said, Pat, Pat, come back and bring the lamp. Pat came back, and he stood for a while with the lamp over the bedside. And due course, the second child was born. The priest looked up, and he said, Pat, you have a second fine son. Pat said, Oh, that's grandfather, but I do need a drink. And he went over and put it down. He just got the second drink, and the priest said, Pat, Pat, come back and bring the lamp. He came back, he stood a while with the lamp a third time, due course, the third child was born. The priest looked up and he said, Pat, you have a wonderful daughter. And Pat said, oh, that's grandfather, but tell me, he said, do you think it's the light that's attracting them? <laughs> the, we, we have to hope it's the light that attracted you to this convention. There's one other Irish story I like to tell. It's about the Irish truck driver who was driving a big trailer truck along a little country lane in Ireland, and he got the truck stuck under a concrete bridge and couldn't get it out. And he was there for about an hour trying to back the truck up and pull it forward. He tried to rock it. He let the air out of the tires. Nothing would avail. That truck was jammed in there, and it wasn't going to move. And after a bit, he finally got out, and he was standing there looking at the truck. And this had been going on for an hour. And there was a big Irish cop standing on the corner, just rocking back and forth, watching all this, had never said a word. And finally, he walked over to the truck driver, and he said, as the Irish do, he said, are you stuck? And the driver looked at him. He said, no. He said, actually, I was delivering the bridge, and I lost the address. <laughs> I, I'll tell you one other story. <laughs> I, the the cler clergy stories keep running in my mind. There's a story about the, the priest and the chief of police in a little town up in New England. And uh, on Sunday mornings, the people all came to church and they parked their cars anywhere they chose and went into church. And the chief of police finally came to the priest and he said, Father, do something for me. I can't move traffic through town on Sunday mornings. Would you make sure that the people all park in the side streets and in the parking lot in the back and so forth? And they had elaborate instructions. And the priest said, thought about it a while, and he said, look, chief, I can't help you. 
I have enough trouble just getting the good people to come out and pray with me on Sunday morning. You worry about where they park their cars. That's a division of responsibility. I have my responsibility, you have yours. So, chief went away, and there was a very bitter feud between them. They didn't speak to one another for four or five weeks. And one morning, the priest woke up, and he looked out on the lawn of the rectory. There was the carcass of a dead jackass. He went to the phone, and he called the chief, and he said, uh, Chief, I have a problem. He said, there's a dead jackass out on my lawn. The chief thought a while, and he said, Father, what'd you call me for? You remember that division of responsibility? Well, burying the dead, isn't that your bag? <laughs> the priest, priest thought a while, and he said, yes, yes, you're right, chief, of course. I just thought I'd call to notify the next of kin. <laughs> I... Now, if, now, if Benny and Dorsey and the other nice uh, policemen in this town who treated me so well on the way in will forget that joke, we can go back to the airport. I did not lose the address, and I must deliver it to you. But like Monsignor Higgins, I don't really enjoy my predicament. I understand that Ben Hooks and, and Les Brown obviously ripped this place up yesterday. George Higgins speaks with the authority of the Almighty and with the brilliance of a lifetime spent advancing the cause of working people. And to further complicate matters, you're all waiting for me to get out of the way so you can hear the beautiful and charming Valerie Harper. I must tell you, however, what my real claim to fame is. It is not that I work for the AFL-CIO or hold George Meany's coat. It is rather that in my youth, my first job in the lead movement, I was a business agent for Local 32B of the Service Employees Union in New York City. That union represents the elevator operators, the janitors, and doormen in the New York apartment houses. And I'm the guy who used to handle grievances for Carlton, the doorman, on the Valerie Harper show. And those of you who know Carlton know how busy we were handling his grievances. Nonetheless, I am delighted to be here and have the opportunity to say a couple of words on a couple of subjects of serious concern on our labor law reform effort and its failure last year, on our latest problems with labor management consultants, and on the trade union movement and your and my hopes for its future. I wanted particularly to come to this convention because it provides me with a long overdue opportunity to publicly express my appreciation, President Meany's appreciation, the appreciation of the National AFL-CIO, to your president, Vic Busey, for his tireless and unselfish efforts in working to secure votes for cloture on labor law reform. I had the unhappy duty of picking up that telephone four or five times and saying, Vic, would you please come up to Washington and see if we can get a final pledge of support from Senator Long. And I shall always be deeply grateful that Vic was always at the other end of the phone and the following morning was willing to be in Washington and do anything he could to help. He is a superb leader. And you and he and the other officers of the Louisiana AFL-CIO, all of you, have built a state fed that you can be proud of and a state fed that's universally recognized as one of the finest in this country. The fact that we were ultimately unsuccessful in the fight for labor law reform doesn't mean that the effort was lacking or that we don't appreciate the class of the opposition. Never before in American political history have employers been more united, spent more money, fielded more manpower, and unleashed more vehemence than they did in their successful effort to defeat labor law reform. Yep, they won a victory. They won it by a single vote in a lopsided fashion on cloture when we had 59 and they had 41. And my mother taught me that you always win when the numbers go that way, but you're not in the center of the United States. But they didn't win the war by a damn sight. The issues which were combined under the banner of labor law reform are not going to go away. Those issues are at the heart of the American system of respect for individual rights and respect for law and order. And we're not going to rest until those rights are translated into reality. Lawlessness in all of its forms is rampant in the business community today. The violations of the legal rights of workers seeking to form a union are only part of a pattern. During one six-month period last year, the Wall Street Journal 
the Bible of the business community, didn't publish a single issue that did not contain at least one article about corporate outlaws, about bribery, payoffs to foreign government, illegal slush funds, the blatant disregard of environmental or worker protection laws, price fixing, you name it, some employer did it. Corporate law breaking has become an everyday function of corporate greed. But what made labor law reform different and so enduring an issue is that violations of labor law are violations of the most basic human rights. In their pursuit of profits, the Winn Dixies and the J.P. Stevens of the corporate world do deliberate and malicious damage to their fellow human beings. And that we're never going to accept, that we're never going to tolerate. Right now in Washington, we are talking and trying to develop new legislation, much more modest than we would like, but new legislation to secure at least some of the most pressing improvements the labor law so desperately needs. We're not going to get the entire bill, at least not right away, but we're going to make some progress now and then go on relentlessly year after year, one bite at a time. And you know well that history is replete with examples of the slow, sometimes tortuous path of progressive legislation. And we all know, or else we wouldn't be here, that eventually good does triumph over evil, that the labor movement and its allies are never going to cease trying, and that we have a pretty good track record for eventual success. But I didn't come to talk with you about the glorious fight for labor law reform, or the reasons why only one of the 22 Democratic senators from the South actually voted for cloture. And I don't intend to make a speech about the host of serious problems confronting the nation, inflation, recession, national health insurance, foreign affairs. I'm sure you'll hear enough of those, enough about those issues from the politicians. I came here to talk with you about a serious threat to the future of our unions and our collective bargaining agreements. This is not just an effort to weaken you or your unions, like the compulsory open shop laws, the right to work for less law that you're currently saddled with. What I'm talking about is a deliberate, calculated campaign to destroy your unions and all unions. It's a war on the labor movement, a war unilaterally declared by companies big and small. The army is no longer dressed like the thugs of the past, and brass knuckles and billy clubs have been replaced by three-piece suits and attache cases. They speak in softer tones, and the words are more polite. The message is the same, bust unions. Their purpose is to effectively deny workers the right to form a union and to try to deauthorize and decertify those unions which workers have formed for their protection. They practice the most insidious form of psychological warfare using fear, intimidation, thought control. They are the consultants, the hired guns available for a fee to try to bust unions. Let me just offer a commercial for a, for a corporate product that I've never endorsed before, I've never done before. But I saw a movie the other night named Norma Ray, and if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's a magnificent story of the effort of the workers in a southern textile plant called the O.P. Henley Textiles, and I think the P is an accurate translation, but the effort of the workers in that plant to form a union and the company's effort to strike fear into the hearts of all the workers in that plant to intimidate them and to have them vote against the union. It is one of the most, I think, one of the most honest and, and obviously one of the most sympathetic treatments the American trade union movement has ever had from a commercial movie producer. It's a great, great movie. But the consultants are in that movie too. In there for a fee, plying their wares, convincing, trying to convince the workers that they don't need a union. Many of those people in today's order of union busters are lawyers. And despite the fact that lawyers are bound by oath to be officers of the court and to promote the primacy of law, they regularly and repeatedly counsel employers to bend the law, to flaunt the law, to ignore lawful court orders, to twist the law for personal gain. But the lawyers and the consultants aren't alone. They're being helped by the industrial relations psychologists, people who know how to manipulate minds, and people who know how to administer tests on hiring to determine whether or not a potential employee is liable to be 
attracted to joining the union or liable not to be, and guess which one they hire. The stock tactics are fear, I say, fear of being fired, fear of losing a job, fear of a plant closing, fear of strikes, and intimidation, the ever-present supervisor, the visits to the home by fellow workers, the subtle change in working conditions, the questions, the lie detector tests, and the blacklist. The aim of the industrial psychologist turned consultant is to train workers, that's their term, not mine, to feel positively toward the employer so they will no longer believe that they need a union. The system is one of what the psychologists call positive and negative reinforcement. It's like the experiments college students run on mice in freshman psychology classes. Many of the tactics of today's union busters would have been effectively eliminated by the passage of labor law reform. The unconscionable delays, the illegal refusals to bargain, endless litigation and the like. But a minority of the U.S. Senate placed the protection of the rights of workers lower on the totem pole than they placed the need to pay homage to corporate America with its growing number of political action committees and its growing contributions to election campaigns. We're not going to wait for the passage of labor law reform to end these illegal tactics. We're going to try to identify the individuals, their tactics, and their legal and ethical responsibilities. At the midwinter meeting, the AFLC Executive Council authorized our National Organizing Coordinating Committee to take action to counter the activities of these so-called labor management consultants. The first step in that process is information. In less than a month, the committee has collected data on 108 firms and 125 individuals, people like the notorious law firm of Coleman and Lang of New Orleans, which I'm sure many of you have had dealings with. We're finding out what tactics they use, who profits from their advice, how much they make, and who controls them. Then we're going to be better able to provide unions with material on what to expect and how to counter the tactics of these consultants. The next step is a legal one. We're going to seek to have the Labor Department enforce the law, which theoretically requires consultants to register and make financial disclosure. These persuaders who don't obey should be subject to all the penalties of the law. God knows the trade union leader who fails to file is subject to those penalties. The lawyers who make it a practice to skirt the law or counsel illegal actions should be aware. At the proper time, and before the proper tribunal, they're going to have to account for their activities. If they're not in compliance with the legal canons of ethics, then the bar associations and the other organizations of lawyers responsible for policing their own profession have to be faced with the task of taking some action against them. A major activity of the committee is going to be in training. Union officers and organizers need new techniques and new strategies. No longer are we simply engaged in a test of strength with employers. But increasingly, we're faced with competing against the industrial psychologist, the propaganda writer, and the slick lawyer. We in the National AFL-CIO have an added responsibility in the fight. We have to continue to make a case to the business community, to the responsible business community, to the extent it exists, to make the case urging that responsible part of the business community to assess the tactics and the role of these labor management consultants. We think we have a good case. Labor relations in the United States are the most stable of any industrialized nation in the world. American unions are more responsible, more democratic, more supportive of the entire economic and political system than most other trade union movements. The business community has a choice. Either learn to live with the American trade union movement or face the consequences, consequences which might result from its destruction. I don't think most American businessmen have thought that question through, but I submit they should. No free society ever survives if a free labor movement is destroyed. If companies seek to deny workers their voice in this economic system through their own unions, then the voice the companies will hear speaking for workers is going to be one that they won't like nearly as well. But we aren't going to wait for business to call off its dogs. We cannot back down from a fight. We are made up of fighters. We were born in that tradition, and the battle's been joined. 
The consultants seem to work best in the dark, hidden from public view, where they counsel lawbreakers, devise schemes to beat organizing campaigns, spawn decertification or deauthorization drives. And it's time we let the sun shine in on their activities. Like the La Follette hearings in the Senate of the 30s detailed the union busters of that era and the Kennedy hearings of the late 50s unmasked a leader crop, so too can public inquiry into the activities of today's union busters serve a useful purpose. To do the job, we need information. We need names, dates, tactics, companies, sample literature. We ask all of you to be on the alert to help us gather that information. In every organizing campaign, in every decertification campaign, when you see or suspect the presence of a consultant, inform your national union and send along all the material and all the information you can. It's going to be very useful to somebody else. With your help, we're going to try to let a little sunlight shine in on these folks and try to make it really possible for unorganized workers to have a free choice about whether or not they want a union to represent them. And to do the larger job of making our labor movement increasingly effective and of making our nation increasingly responsive to people's needs, we need to do two additional things. We need to build coalitions with our natural allies. And we need to tell those who are not our natural allies to go to hell. And we need to rebuild and to revitalize the labor movement. The struggle for labor law reform, a struggle as it was to ensure the most basic rights of workers, taught us a great deal. I would rather have won, but there are lessons even in losing. The coalition which we built, probably the broadest coalition in history in support of workers' rights, and surely the broadest coalition since the civil rights fights of the 60s, was splendidly effective. The women's groups, minority organizations, black and Hispanic, the churches, the liberal organizations, consumer groups were all with us and continue now to deserve our support. And we need to maintain that coalition through the fight for passage of ERA, through the budget fight in this Congress, and through the political campaigns ahead. The coalition that opposed us showed every one of America's corporations, big and small, falling in line with all of the conservatives and all of the radical right of this country. And we need never to forget what they did. We need to take another look at our political action and to resolve to be even tougher in giving our blessing to candidates and even more effective in supporting them when we do give it. Your efforts to develop effective political information committees in each House and Senate district in this state is a splendid one, and it needs everybody's support. And when it comes to endorsing candidates, we need to take a little harder look than we have in the past at those who say they are our friends. It may well be that the choice of the lesser of two evils is not a good choice for us anymore. We need, finally, to revitalize our own labor movement. It is a movement. Know that, be a part of it, make every member aware that he or she is not a member of a local union or a national union or the AFL-CIO, but a part as well of a living trade union movement which has a broad mission to improve this whole nation. We need to make our own unions bigger, scrupulously honest. We need to make them tougher, caring, more effective, more militant, more dynamic, more open to all, from membership to top leadership. We need to make union members out of people who are today dues payers. We need to make every trade unionist anxious to say, I'm a trade unionist and proud of my union. I'm proud to be part of a trade union movement which cares about this country. I work union, I buy union. I'm registered, I work in political campaigns and on political issues, and I contribute and I vote. I don't cross picket lines, I don't buy struck goods, I don't buy boycott, boycotted goods. I support other workers' rights in my community. And hallelujah, someday they even may say, I go to union meetings. When we've done that job, we're going to have 
the kind of powerful, first-rate, honest, ethical, responsive labor movement that we will all be proud of. And we'll be well along the road to having the kinds of politicians and the kinds of politics, the kind of government, the kind of state and nation that we all want so desperately. Thank you very much. Tom, thank you very much. I told you he was a great labor leader. He always brings a great story. And I agree with Tom that the biggest problem that we have in the nation today are the employers who are determined to abolish labor unions in the country. There's a concerted effort to do exactly that. They are being staffed by professional consultants and others who are dedicated to doing exactly that. And consequently, we do owe our obligation. We must carry out our responsibility by providing to the national organization information that we have available to us from time to time regarding the activities of these people. We appreciate Tom very much bringing us that message. When we were working so hard on labor law reform, and all of you know that labor law reform simply was putting into law what everybody today believes is the law, that you shall have the right to join or not join a labor union free of intimidation, fear, free of coercion, free of the threat of loss of your job, free of the loss of credit, free from being blacklisted, all of those things the federal labor law today supposedly gives. But we have found out to the sorrow of hundreds of thousands of workers of our nation that that's not true. Yet when we were leading a fight to do exactly that, the thing that most of our enemies say they are in favor of, they were the ones who were there to stop the passage. Would you believe that Ed Stimel testifying before the legislature of our state said, we want everybody in Louisiana to have the right to join or not to join a labor union. We don't want them coerced by anyone, labor leaders or anyone else. And yet when we are attempting to change the federal laws to say exactly that, Mr. Steinmel lied again because he was there to say that he was against the bill that he didn't believe it was good for the people of this nation to pass a bill which would guarantee exactly what he had been saying to the workers of Louisiana that he believed in. We lost that bill, not because a majority of the Congress of the United States wasn't with us, but because three-fifths of the, of the United States Senate was not with us. We failed by one vote, one vote, being able to write into the federal laws of our nation what everyone has believed for the last 40 years that they had the right to do. That ought to tell us clearly that every vote counts. Every vote counts. Recently, I was in one of the states of the Union in Pennsylvania where the outcome of, a, of an election showed that the fight between the Republicans and the Democrats wound up in this fashion. 202 members of the House elected were Democrats. 202 members of the House elected were Republicans. The one deciding vote which would have decided whether the Republicans or the Democrats controlled that Congress that vote was tie. One union member voting in that vote could have directed the destiny of the state of Pennsylvania for the next four years. And consequently, it means that every vote counts. And when you stay at home and say, my vote's not going to make any difference anyway, you never know but what you might be one day the savior of Louisiana. 
just as that one vote in Pennsylvania could have saved that state. Tom, we are very grateful to you and we assure to you and the national AFL-CIO that we will do everything in our power to help you in the program that you're now starting out on. Thank you very much for being with us. Call upon us any time that we can assist you in the future.